here. Um, what, what I'd like to do, so I have, you, know, I could, you could go on a whole semester on all the phenomenology of the standard model. And so I have really two days which I can devote to that. And so what is it that I want to do in those two days? I want to do something field theoretic rather than just phenomenology. Or I want to do a set of things field theoretic. And I might, uh, I should have them hook up to be on the standard model, so that's one thing I want to do. And they should also be things that everyone that sees you guys coming from UMass expects you to know. Okay? So the, I'm going to start with the, the, uh, the Carl Lagrange for the standard model, the, for Carl perturbation theory, because there's some techniques that I really want to show you there that, that are, are good stuff. I'm going to do weak decays, and then I'm going to try to do some stuff on, on uh, Ws and Zs and Higgs and stuff at high energies leading to the beyond the standard model and talk a little bit about beyond the standard model before I get to supersymmetry. Okay, so that's the plan for the next two days. Okay, so we're, we're going to do the pion story in QCD first. Pions, kions. Okay. The, we were really well set up for this because of having done all the, the sigma model stuff. But there is a, a, a difference here is that you, it's hard to, to put your hand on the, the pion fields in the QCD Lagrangian. So you know, we have the same symmetries. You know, if, if the quarks were massless to zero, then there'd be a uh, an SU3 invariance, sorry, psi left, um, psi right goes to R psi right, where those are separate invariances. That's broken by, by quark masses, of course. The quark masses will end up arguing are, are relatively light, much, much smaller than the proton mass. Even the strange quark is, is one tenth of it, the proton mass. So, so we would expect this would be almost a symmetry, but you don't see it. So you don't see don't see partners. Partners for various states. So this would this would this type of symmetry would require that you saw them. For every particle with some parity, there'd be a negative parity particle around associated with it, be a partner of the proton. So that tells us that we expect that this goes through symmetry breaking. So this is, the symmetry is hidden. Okay. What that means is that, that the states that have the same energy, so it tells us that we have Goldstone bosons, And the states that have the same energy are things like the proton and the proton plus a pi and with uh, momentum equal to zero. Those would be symmetry related states where the, the symmetry transformation is the axial part of the transformation. So that those, those have different parities, but but the same energy. Okay. So, but we can't put our hands on the mechanism. So, so the big difference here is you can't put your hands on the mechanism. So, so we give it a different name. This is dynamical symmetry breaking. Okay. Spontaneous symmetry breaking goes when you have a scalar field around. When you don't have a scalar field and you can't put your hands on it, you, you get um, dynamical symmetry breaking. Okay? But then we expect the same sort of thing. So we expect you know, the Lagrangian starts off like we had before, F squared over 4, trace d mu u, d mu u dagger, plus stuff. And it's the plus stuff that's 
that's the interesting part now. Okay. So, my pathway here, that, and the big technique that I want to show you is this, this external source method. So I'm going to modify QCD. So let's let's do the following. Here's QCD. QCD is minus a quarter F squared psi bar I D slash minus M psi. Okay. Psi in this case is going to be components and we're going to have a, a lot of fun with the fact that there's multiple different spaces here. There's going to be, there's a, each of these components is a four component spinner. Each of them carries three colors. They also, the psi also comes now in three flavors. So there's three separate spaces here. There's color space, Dirac space, and flavor space, okay? Most of the time, Dirac is going to be just suppressed. Everything's going to be four components, and we'll take that for granted. We are going to have a little confusion because SU3 of color and SU3 of flavor are both SU3s, and so there's going to be SU3 matrices floating around for a while that are both, that have both types. So. In this formulation right here, at this stage, this d slash is regular derivative plus i g lambda a gluon a well slashed over two. Okay, so that lambda there is going to be an SU three matrix in color space. Okay. And just to emphasize the point, let's put a big unit matrix there in flavor. Okay, so it's, every, uh, the, the, it's the same for each flavor. Okay, the, this M here is a, is a matrix. So M psi bar M psi is Psi bar left, um, M psi right, plus psi bar right, M psi left, with M is MU, MD, MS. It's a matrix. So that's in flavor space now. Okay, so it's a three by three matrix flavor space. Okay. Now, I'm going to change, modify this. I'm going to add now a bunch of other terms here where, which aren't there in QCD. So now let's add these external sources. Okay. The external sources are going to be left-handed sources, right-handed sources, um, scalar sources, and pseudo-scalar sources. Okay. Those, these are going to be three by three matrices in flavor space. So each of them, let's, let, let me take S as an example. It's a scalar. It can be written as S0 plus TA SA, okay? Now, TA is also going to be an SU3 matrix. But I'm, but I'm going to use T for flavor. So 
So much like we use tau for isospin and at sigma for spin for poly matrices, here I'll, I'm going to use T for flavor matrices and lambda for color matrices. Okay. Okay. So our new modified Lagrangian is going to be the following. It's going to be have the still the, the, the gluons. It's going to have sidebar left, ID left slash side left, plus sidebar right, ID right slash side right, plus sidebar left, S plus IP, side right, sidebar right, uh, that's, sure, that should be S, and S minus IP, side left. Okay. In in D left D, D left is it's going to have the usual piece D mu plus I um, lambda A over two G lambda A over two G A slash times the unit matrix. And then it's also going to have, I assume if I want, I want the L mu there, L mu of x for the left-handed one, and the same thing for right, uh, d slash right. Okay. So, various things we can do then. This, I, you see I have no math terms. So, if I want pure QCD, I just, I take this Lagrangian and I set L mu equals R mu equals zero and I S equals the, the mass matrix, it's a three by three matrix, so it's, it's set equals that mass matrix. If I want um, QED plus a photon, P, I said P is equal to zero, okay? QED plus a photon, I, I, I take L mu equals R mu equals E Q A mu, where these got, that's the matrix now too. This is the matrix two thirds minus a third minus a third. Okay, so it's trace this matrix. If I, and then S equals, uh, S equals to M, P is equal to zero. If I want, that's what I was, QCD. If I want QCD plus a W, I take, I said R mu equals to zero, take L mu is, <coughs> um, I want G, G2 over two square root of two, W mu plus mu, and the matrix that I take is V U D V U S zero 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 plus her the Hermitian conjugate with a W minus. Okay. okay, so this this gets a transition from an S quark to an up quark, a down quark to charge W, okay? So I can do all those. That's, that's, 
it's just, it's just left-handed. Yes, the W coupling is purely left-handed, right? So the right-handed piece does. There's nothing. It, this gives us the one plus gamma five terms there. You know, the one. So because it only sits then with phi left and phi left out there. Um, and actually, to be actually, now that I think about it, this is what my notes say. Actually, the the way I have it written, there's no there's no two there because there's a extra half when I take this left left is one half one plus gamma five. Okay. All right, but it gets but it gets better if I wanted to take matrix elements of various things, I can get the matrix elements in the following way. So you can get currents from this. If, if I want the, for example, if I take the derivative of Lagrangian respect as zero, okay, that's then just psi bar is psi. So once I form a path integral, if I want to take get the expectation value of psi bar psi, which we'll, I'll show you, I'll do this in, in a minute, all we do is to take the derivative of respect as zero. Okay. If we want, if we want the um, left-handed current, I take the the derivative of the Lagrangian respect to L A mu, so it's, it's the it's one of those left-hand currents in flavor space. I get um, psi, psi bar left gamma mu oops, um, T A phi left. Okay, and this is, remember, it's a flavor thing, so this, this is all the flavor currents, left-handed flavor currents. At, if I want, if I want the electromagnetic current, I take the derivative of Lagrangian with respect to A mu after I've made the substitution up above there to get psi bar gamma mu Q psi. Okay. So I can, one of the things I have is that I have all the, the currents here. But there's even a better thing that you can get out of this. I can get now an, an, an enhanced symmetry. Now, those, those sources there are, those extra currents are at my disposal. I can just choose them as I want. So, the, I can imagine that when I look at the QCD transformation, it goes to L phi left, phi right, goes to R phi right. I can supplement that with, by transforming my external currents if I, if I choose to. So let's imagine that I take, for example, um, S plus I P and take that into L S plus I P R dagger. Okay. If I do that, that leaves that leaves the thing that I had there, psi bar left, s plus i p, psi left is invariant, or psi right. Okay. Doing this, it's exactly invariant. It's not approximately invariant. It's exactly invariant.
Okay. So that if I wanted to analyze this theory with these external sources, I can use the exact symmetry for, to carry it along for a long time. And then at the end of the day, I stick in S is the, the masses, and I have the, a good effect of Lagrangian. So I've used the exact symmetry instead of an approximate symmetry. It's even better than that. I can also make this a gauge symmetry. So SU3 left cross SU3 right. We now have it in exact symmetry. Let's make it a gauge symmetry. Okay, well, that's, I have to do something else to do that, but we sort of know how to do this already. I've got these external sources, L mu there. If I transform them like a gauge field, I can make things invariant. So let's just see how you can do that. Let's take um, psi bar left. I D slash left, phi left. Okay. Actually, let me give you, I'll give you what the transformation is first. So let's do it here. Um, I'm going to take L, L mu, and transform it into L, L mu, plus L dagger D mu L L dagger. Okay, this this L L dagger here is just the usual global symmetry that you needed. We we needed that already up here. So I just showed you these guys being invariant, but I needed this to make the the D psi bar d slash psi invariant. But this is going to make it now gauge invariant also. So if I choose to make this transformation, I, I then, um, so let's look at this here. This, this, this goes into psi bar L dagger, and then I have I D slash actually let's let me take away the I because my notes don't have it so it's easier to do without is D slash plus I I would then want L L mu plus L dagger D mu L L dagger L phi L. Okay, so we get to say L many times. There's lots of L's around here. Um, so first, if these were just global currents, this would be an, an invariant. This, this, this would pass through the derivative. That would be invariant. And these guys would cancel that, and I wouldn't need that term. Okay. But now if it's a gauge current, the the tricky pieces are then um, I get L dagger D slash L um, from from that first piece and I'm missing my factor of I right there. I'm sorry, I'm missing I there and there, which is going to hopefully make this work. Um, so there's that piece, then there's the plus the usual ID slash, which where it's passed through. Then there's the I L slash, and then the last piece is I, so the L's cancel, it's the L dagger, D slash 
L, but it's I squared, so it becomes minus. So those guys cancel, and I can end up back with d slash L by L. Okay? Or, you know, just basically this is the, that d, d slash, or d mu uh, L transforms to L d mu L dagger. Okay, so that, that's Okay, good, fair enough. So, we have now have, have this be a gauge invariant. Um, and so our summary now is that we have psi goes to L and R, psi L and R, combined with this L mu trans transforming, as I just did it, there's an R mu is transforming um, L, L dagger, R, R dagger, and S plus I P goes to L S plus I P R dagger. And for, for later purposes, we can then give the equivalent of, of gauge fields if I take D mu left, D nu left, and I anti-commute them. This gives me a three by three matrix, which is D mu L nu minus d nu l mu plus l mu commuted with l nu. So those are three by three matrix indices, and those are all lowercase l's. Which we can call l mu nu, which then obviously has the transformation property that l mu nu goes to L, L mu nu, L dagger, and there's an R mu nu, which goes to R, R mu nu, R dagger. So we've got all these covariant objects now. But this is wonderful. We now have a, not just a approximate global symmetry, but an, an exact Late gauge symmetry. So it's much more powerful. Okay. Okay, so now we go to the go to the path integral. Okay. We write Z, which is going to be a function of sigma of S P L and R is the inter the path integral d a mu d psi psi bar e to the i integral d 4x L of psi a s p L r. Okay. Okay. That's that then defines our theory, and we can do lots of things with it. If we want to get matrix elements, let's say I want the matrix element zero, psi bar psi. That's then minus i, you know, it's plus my, uh, plus i, the variation of z one over z with respect to S zero. 
That's the vacuum matrix element side by side. That's a, that's a big, that's a relatively important object in QCD. This is a the signal of chiral symmetry breaking. Okay. Because this is the, the statement that the vacuum is not invariant under the symmetry, right? This is this is not that that object there is not invariant under a chiral transformation. So if the vacuum were invariant, that thing would have to be zero. If the vacuum is not invariant, then it's not equal to zero. Okay since it's not invariant. It's, it's the equivalent of the vacuum expectation value in spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay, if, if the vacuum expectation value is not zero, then we've picked out a preferred, preferred direction in this symmetry direction, and so we've broken the symmetry. Likewise here, this indicates the preferred direction in chiral space. Is that, is that clear? Is that, that's, that's a useful thing. The other things you can do is, let's say you want the, that's a two-point function, it's a psi, oh, let's be general, TA over, over two, gamma mu one plus gamma five, psi hat x, and the same thing, sidebar tb over 2, 1 plus gamma 5, psi hat y. That's, you can get that by just taking the two derivatives, so it's, it's minus i quantity squared, delta z, delta left a at x, delta, and let's, I want one of these to be nu, so l, l mu, delta l b nu at y. This is, this is the vacuum polarization diagram. The current comes in, that's related to that guy right there. Okay, if you try calculating, it's just the, the fermion loop there. Okay, but you know if we re if we take this variation here and we had the full z, then we would get not only this loop but we would get all all the gluon corrections to it. So we get all the stuff there. Okay. So it's. In perturbation theory, it's a single loop, but in, in the full theory, it's, it's everything. All right. It, it, it doesn't, well, I tell you what, what does give some information about the symmetry. If, if, if I took the two combinations here that are non-vanishing by parity, there's the gamma mu, gamma mu, and gamma mu, gamma five with gamma mu, gamma five, okay? So the vector and axial vectors. Okay. The, those two would be equal to each other if, if the, um, if QCD were exact. Uh, I mean, if chiral symmetry were exact, I'm sorry. If chiral symmetry is, is exact, vector currents and axial vector currents have the same, all the same physics because it's a chiral rotation of, of each other. You take a vector current, you do a chiral rotation, it turns into an axial current. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, yes. It's actually even more than here's Here's the one that's actually, if I take the variation w respect to L mu and the variation respect to R, okay? So I take this thing and I have psi bar gamma mu one plus gamma five at one point, 
sine and psi bar gamma, gamma nu one minus gamma five at the other point. That zero if if no no symmetry breaking. Okay, and the argument here is is that that the gamma mu gamma gamma nu piece and the gamma mu gamma five gamma nu gamma five have to be the same by that's the this one argument, and then these um, would then cancel. Okay, the cross terms vanish by parity. Okay. And if you look at this in QCD, here's what happens. It's actually interesting. Um, you start off, this is, this is a correlation function between vector currents and axial currents. There's a long story of how you get to it, okay? But, but the easy part of the story, let's, let's, I can, might as well do the story. The, the one that's the vector vector can be probed in E plus E minus goes to hadrons, okay? You take E plus E minus, they go to a photon that goes to current. So we have E plus E minus going in goes to a current. Okay. When you square that matrix element, this part in here is related to the imaginary part of this with VV. Okay. So this is the imaginary part, the imaginary part of, of that correlator. Okay. So you can get from the imaginary part, you, you can reconstruct it by a dispersion relation. Okay. Um, if you do tau decays, tau goes to mu or E, let's make it E. So now tau goes to new hadrons. Okay, it's something that looks like this with a W there going to hadrons. The square of that the square of this guy can give you information about AA. Okay, so that's, that's that's our sources of data on these things, and then the the imaginary parts of the spectral functions look like the following: the 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 vector starts off winning, so this is this is the, the imaginary parts pi v v minus pi a a. That's what I'm plotting. The, the, the vector parts start off winning. It turns over, goes to zero, comes back up. It has a little oscillation and goes to zero. Okay? This, this here is the row resonance. This is roughly the axial resonance. It's, it's called the A1. And then out, out further, it does go to zero. Um, so what that says is that that once you get away from the low energy regime where you you can just use perturbation theory, then the chiral symmetry actually seems to work. You know, you, but at low energies, these these would be the partners of each other. If if there was no dynamical symmetry breaking, they'd somehow have to sit on top of each other and cancel. They're split apart as part of the consequences of dynamical symmetry breaking, so this guy is not zero. Okay. Yeah. So, so they they almost average to zero. In this, that's right. They'd have to be actually point by point. They'd have to be zero, in the, in if it was totally symmetric. 
to be zero point by point. Here, it almost averages to zero. There's, it turns out that if you weight it by the power s, it almost integrates to zero. Uh, there's, there's a long story there. There's the Weinberg sum rules, and there's some rules for the pi and decay constant, and it's good stuff, but I can't do it. Okay? But for our purposes, this is a, a good news for what we want to do. We want to match, we want to write out an effect of Lagrangian. Okay. At low energies, the only dynamical degrees of freedom are the pi and the k. And let me just, I'll write things with pi ons, and which we assume the k ons are there also, just, just to save things. Okay. So we, what we want to do here, the matching condition here, No, we can't do it the same way we're doing the sigma model because we don't have analytic control over the things. But we, here's the plan, is that you, you take z, which is L mu of, sorry, s in plus p, L and r, that's, in the full theory is dA, d psi, d psi bar, e to the i, L of QCD, and we're going to write an effective theory which has the pi and dk e to the i integral d4x, an effective Lagrangian that's a function of pi s p l r. Okay. But now this guy has to have an exact gauge okay and then later on if we wanted to so this this is now just our 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 matching condition we know that that has to have that that exact gauge symmetry so then at the end of the day we take that and we perhaps set S to the quark mass matrix and I get the exact effect of Lagrangian for QCD. Okay. Yeah, in practice, what we're really saying is, is that you know, at, if I was to try to do this at all energies, this is appropriate for low energies, I take all the, all the degrees of freedom, all the the hadrons, and I'd write an effective Lagrangian that had integral d pi, d proton, d neutron, d, d sigma star, d everything in the world. But then I integrate out all the heavy stuff, and I just end up with the light stuff plus an effective Lagrangian. Okay. So how to do this? Well, clearly we know how to build in the global SU3 symmetry. Sorry. We take, we put the pi on and k on fields in, in U, which is exponent of e to the i ta phi a over some, with some constant f. So that has all the the SU3 fields in it. That's the pi k's, and there's an eta. And we we want u goes to L u r dagger, and we write out effective Lagrangians that start off like trace d mu u d mu u dagger. Okay, so that's that's how to do the global symmetry. But now we need to make it a, a gauge symmetry. Okay. 
Okay. So we need some d mu u that goes to L d mu u our dagger when we do a, a gauge symmetry. Okay, the solution is the following. Um, d mu u is d mu u plus i l mu u minus i u r mu. Okay, remember these are three by three matrices, so the ordering is is important. And I guess I mean we could work it out, but you you can sort of see. Let's let's not work it out. Um, when u turns into l u r dagger, there's a derivative here on this side with on the l, and that's compensated for by this l. There's there's a corresponding thing, a derivative acting on the right side which is compensated by the gauge transformation of that guy. Okay, I mean, if you want, I can work it out. It's all sitting there. Okay. Okay, but, and, and so we've, we now have building blocks. The building blocks are going to be um, u, d mu u, I'll, I'll, we'll have l mu nu, r mu nu, and we will have um, sigma plus s plus s plus i p, which I'm going to convert at this stage, it's conventional, to convert into a field chi, which is some constant. It's going to be 2b0, and I'll tell you what b0 is later, s plus i p, which then transforms to chi goes to L um, chi r dagger. Okay, so those are our building blocks. The only the the last the only last thing that we need to do to before st setting off is to figure out how we count the various factors. Okay, L mu is not too hard. So remember, we're doing an energy expansion. So derivatives go like an energy. It's then natural to make L's go like an energy because it sits in the covariant derivative with the same thing. So it's, we count that. Right? So that tells that L mu nu goes like an energy squared. So those are the easy ones. The counting on chi is not as clear. We're going to do the following. We're going to count chi as order energy squared in this energy expansion, small parameter squared. Okay. And this is going to come out from the fact that that after after I take S goes to the quark mass matrix, M pi squared is going to be two B zero times the quark mass. So if we count derivatives like energy, two derivatives like energy squared, then, then two factors of the pi and mass should go like energy squared. So that's, that's the origin of that counting. There's actually been in the, in the field a, a whole little subfield called generalized chiral perturbation theory, which counted chi 
is energy of the first power, and then you needed two factors of chi. So it's, it's like having this B0 vanish here to get the other pi and mass. And that, it's a, a really long story, but seems to be experimentally disproven just by experiment, by, by looking at pi and scattering and things like that. Okay. So to do this, then, Uh, there's no terms with zero derivatives, or, or there's no terms at, at order e to the zero. e to the zero, the only things you could have is u dagger u, which is one, so that's, that's nothing. At two derivatives, e squared, we have trace d mu u, d mu u daggered that um, can be there. And we can also have trace chi u plus u, that's a chi dagger u plus u dagger chi. Okay, so that's possible. So the, the, the piece here is f squared over 4 trace d mu u, d mu u dagger, plus f squared over 4 trace chi u, chi dagger u plus u dagger chi. That's, that's that piece there. Now there's, there's two free parameters here, f and b0 for these two pieces. We don't know what those are, but those are the two free parameters. At order energy of the fourth, let me not construct it. Um, fourth, the obvious ones, you know, the Lagrangian has terms L1, the, the coefficients are at these L coefficients, trace d mu u, d mu u dagger, squared, plus then you go along and you get terms that look like trace chi u plus u dagger chi, trace d mu u, d mu u dagger, and then you go along and you f end up finding terms like trace l mu nu u R mu nu mu dagger. So those are invariants. And there are 10 of them. Okay. If you add a other external currents like, like metrics and stuff, you can go up to more than 10. But this is the, the standard basis. Let's explore that, Lagrangian. Okay. The, the first thing we'll do is, well, let's take, take zero psi bar psi zero. Okay, that matrix element there. That, that's gotten by taking the variation of z with respect to um, s0. And if I do that, let's do it just at tree level. No loops. Okay. Then, in fact, it's easy to do that because the if I'm not doing any loops, there's no pions in the external state. Um, here we go. There's this. There's a two b zero 
time F fitting there. It just turns into, it's actually minus F squared um, B0. Okay. So this constant B0 that we have there is minus 1 over F squared um, times this, this, what's often called the order parameter, the, the thing that signals chiral symmetry breaking. Okay, two of the pi on, pi on and k on masses. All right, so you get m pi squared is b0 mu plus md. So you basically just expand and read off the pi on k and masses. m k plus squared is b0 mu plus mf. m k0 squared B zero M D plus M S M eta squared the eighth component is B zero times its M U plus M D plus four M S with a factor it has to add up to two, so it's one third. And that ends up being four thirds m k squared minus one third m pi squared. Okay. So various things come out of this. And the let's call this one two b zero m hat. M hat is the average. Then we get m hat over m f is m pi squared over 2m k squared minus m pi squared is 1 over 26. We would also get m d minus m u over m f minus m hat is m k zero squared minus m k plus squared over um, actually let me go back and make this over m d plus m u because then I put it over m pi squared This has another little story associated with it. I have to remove the, remove electromagnetic contributions, which which I know how to do, which I can tell you. But but after you do that, it's 0 0.29. So the the real quark mass difference piece is 0 0.29. So it says that roughly m u over md is 0 0.55. Okay, so this is the origin of the pi and k on masses and our information about quark masses. Let me just complete the story here on, on Just, just to complete this, uh, something we did before about the axial anomaly. Okay. So, if if we had a U3 axial symmetry that was spontaneously broken, 
Okay. Then, then we'd end up with we'd have nine Goldstone bosons. Okay. And the mess matrix analysis would, would have given us the following. And the masses would be the following. M squared as a mass matrix would be B0. Well, I have 2M hat here. I have M S plus M hat in the K on cases. I have this two-thirds 2MS two plus M hat there. Those are all the terms that I gave you. The one down here that you would come out would be two-thirds MS plus 2M hat. And there'd also be diagonal ones here. The diagonal ones would be 2 square root of 2 over 3 m hat minus m f okay and there's zeros up here okay if so if we had the symmetry we treated the, the last guy like a gold zone boson we'd have that as our matrix and it, when you diagonalize that you you get you, you get two states m let's call it a squared is m pi squared and m b squared is it's 2m k squared minus m pi squared. Okay. You can sort of see, well, how, how, it takes a little calculation. But actually, it's, it's pretty obvious what, the, what these answers are. This would be, the, the new component here would be u u bar minus dd bar. The new, th this guy would be u u bar plus dd bar. This one would be SS bar, and this is S U bar, so that, that gives us this 2 minus 1. Okay. So that's, that's how you get that. But th so the, the U1 problem, set before the anomaly, was that, that you, could, you could prove by the symmetry analysis that there's a state degenerate with the pi on. Okay. And you could you could even you could allow for some some SG three breaking in that argument, but you could prove that it was had to be lighter than something. Okay. After the anomaly Well, you don't do that anymore. But if you look at the the effects, what it basically would do is it would take there'd be a new contribution to the matrix element, which would be something like this through two gluons here, glue glue, for the singlet guy, a to zero, a to zero. So this is u plus d plus s. That wouldn't be there for a friend of the octets. And the mass matrix then turns into the same old thing, but there'd be then plus something which is often called epsilon there. And so it's the same. And then and then we end up with this guy giving mass to the to the heavier one. 
And so you choose epsilon of, of order 1 GeV. And you end up with states that are the pi k eta 8 and the eta 0, where this is the eta 960. And this is I, uh, eta, this is the, that's the eta prime, this is the eta, this is 549, I think it is. Okay. These guys actually do have some mixing. There's these ms minus md, m hat terms there. These guys have some mixing, which there's a whole set of phenomenology associated with that, too. All right. Well, let's, I have to stop there. <laughs> um, that's, so that's QCD day. Next time will be weekday. We'll do week interactions all day next time.